simply by eating together with your children three times a week dramatically reduce the incidence of obesity in the children and dramatically reduce the incidence of disordered eating. In today's podcast, I talk with my good friend, Sean Stevenson, a nutritional coach, on how just three family meals per week is the minimum bar to set to provide an additional layer of real mental and physical health insurance, and his new amazing recipe book to help make this all happen. So let's dive in. Sean, I'm so excited to talk to you about your new book. I, you and I have the best conversations. I love, normally we do them in person. We've done a couple by Zoom, but we've done a few in person and that's always the best. So hopefully next time it'll be in person. But I am thrilled to have you back on my show. You're the, one of the best people to talk to. You've got so much insight into so much science. I love your science. Must be, you and I are such nerds, seriously. So thank you so much for joining me today. Of course. You know I love talking with you, so this is going to be fun. It's going to be so much fun. And it's going to be so much fun because every time I look at the book you brought out, I get hungry. So you <laughs> Mission accomplished. So there you go. Mission accomplished. You just brought out a beautiful new book about food. And before we dive into that, I want everyone to know that this is not, you know, everyone, there's a lot of food books out there, but this is really something that's very important because it's unique in that you actually bring in elements of knowledge plus you link it back to the mind and you bring in the science and it's all very manageable so it's not a recipe book there's recipes but it's really teaching you about the absolute essence of looking after the mind brain body connection looking after the body and the brain so that the mind can work through an organ and a body that's going to be healthy so thanks for writing this book it's it's amazing you know of course and of course the mission was to create something that you would be proud of because you know that so much of our health, it's really, all of this is springing from the mind. And so that was like the intention really operating behind the scenes in the creation of this book. And in particular, how the aspect of social science and tying that in with nutritional science is is really something special. It's very special. And you do that masterfully. You really do. I wrote a book years ago called Think and Eat Yourself Smart, talking about the whole mind-brain-body connection. You've taken it to a a whole level here, which is just wonderful. So, Sean, just t- tell us why you wrote the book. D- you know what? My listeners need to hear. I know most of them know you, but let's these new new viewers and listeners. Let's start with who you are, a little bit of your background, and then you know why you've written this specific book and how you've written sure. it. Well, you know, it's so funny. Actually, we're in the month now. I'm about to cross my 21st year in working in health and fitness. Congratulations. And- Thank you. So I started off working at the university that I was attending and working in strength and conditioning, a strength and conditioning coach, personal training, and studying nutrition and biology and kinesiology. And then uh, after graduating, opening up my clinical practice, working as a nutritionist, doing a lot of consulting, working with a lot of big businesses and you know helping their, their staff and that kind of stuff and writing books and speaking. But I had no idea I would be doing this for a living, by the way. I just... You know, just kind of, you know, sometimes life qualifies you to do, to do certain things. I've always been a very analytical person, you know, even as a kid, just having a lot of questions. And I've really used that as a superpower, you know, unknowingly, because I was questioning how to get myself healthy growing up in an environment. And this is what we're going to talk about today, yeah. where I was just inundated with poor health and things that are really advantageous to becoming ill and dysfunctional. Uh, about 80% of my family members just growing up were clinically obese. Lots of people had diabetes, heart disease. Um, you know, my my grandfather was really my earliest hero. You know, he had multiple open heart surgeries and passed away prematurely. And, you know, asthma, allergy, I can go on and on. There was pretty much any of the conditions you could name, somebody in my family has it. And that was just normalized to me. And so what hit me being the person in my family, I was the person everybody kind of looked towards is like the athletic, he's going to be, he's going to make it out of this condition that we're in growing up in the inner city through athletics. And that's kind of one of the things that we see, get an example of. And so I thought it was possible for me mm-hmm. and everything was going great. Everything was going great. But at track practice, I was running a time trial with my coach. And just running this 200 meter, right now we just finished the world championships in track. So maybe people have this kind of on their brain a little bit, but I was doing a 200 meter sprint, which is half the track. And just doing that sprint, I ended up breaking my hip just from running because my bone density was so low. 
And I ended up with an advanced arthritic condition of my spine that I got diagnosed with a couple of years later. Really, my body was falling apart. It was as if I was a much, much, much older man inside of a young person's body. And my first physician even gave me that uh, diagnosis when he put the MRI up after looking at my spine that I had this advanced arthritic condition of my spine. He said I had this. He said these are his exact words. He said, you have the spine of an 80 year old man. And my oh. two lower discs were severely degenerated and herniated. And he's kind of just sent me on my way. He said that I asked him, like, what can I do? You know, should I change how I'm exercising? Like, and he said, I'm sorry, son, there's nothing you could do about this. This is unfortunately, this is incurable. And you know, the power of the mind, nocebo effect took on where I went in for a more of a nuisance of a disease or a pain. Mm -hmm. And I left. And within a couple of weeks, I was in chronic debilitating pain because now I believe that I'm going to be in pain for the rest of my life because he told me so. Wow. And I'm not going to be able to walk normally because he told me so. And so that's kind of the, the foundation of what led me back to studying health in college was asking questions. Whereas for two years of suffering and pain, I ask why me every day, just asking like this kind of a uh, tennis match going back and forth with my mind and my biology and starting to when you ask a question to your mind, when you pose a question, mm -hmm. you are going to be scanning your internal and external environment all the time to find the answer to that thing. Right. And so we call this kind of like a, uh, a, a dominant question. And so mine was, why me? Why is my life so bad? Mm -hmm. And so I just kept finding all this evidence as to why my life was so bad. You know, you're, uh, you're not helpable. You're not lovable. You're you know, you're, you're irresponsible, you're self-centered, all of these different things. I grew up in a very volatile environment where my safety was at risk, even literally going to bed. And I might make, wake up to people fighting in my house, you know, to, furniture getting broken, the whole thing, you never know. So I had to be more self-focused to protect myself, but now it was preventing me from connecting. So I'm isolated. And now, so here's where everything changed was, Eventually, thankfully, because I had some people to point me in the right direction, and that person being my grandmother, who I actually um, mentioned in a lot of my work, she believed in me. You know, ever since I was a kid, she made me feel like I was going to do something special with my life. And here I was basically relenting to not being what I had as my potential. And it just really, it motivated me to fulfill her wishes for me and her, 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 her desires and her perception of who I could be. And I just got up a little bit of strength to ask a different question, which was, what can I do to feel better? Mm. And over time, that question became, as I started to feel better, and, and that wasn't just like everything changed from that, but I started to do different things based on this new question that became dominant. Eventually that question evolved to, how can I be the healthiest person in the world? And of course, you just for people that know my story, I'm going to fast forward this a little bit, but I ended up nine months later getting a scan done of my spine and it completely re regenerated the, the disc degeneration. Now I could see the light shining through them. The two herniated discs had retracted. I was out of pain. I transformed my body and my appearance. And now I'm helping other people because I feel so good. And people were just attracted to me and coming up and asking me for help at my university. And part of that was I changed the chemistry in my body, I changed the ingredients that I was making my tissues out of. Mm -hmm. The reason that my body was breaking down prematurely was, and this is not an exaggeration, and we're, we'll talk about some of this data today. I ate fast food at least 300 days a year, all right? Ultra processed food, fast food, it was the predominant aspect of my diet. And that's not, I'm not abnormal. According to the BMJ, just published a couple of years ago, 60% of the average American's diet is made of ultra processed food. And in this new book, in this new project I'm sharing for the first time in book form, it's even worse for our children. A study published in JAMA found that, and they tracked American children's food intake for 20 years. All right, so it's a big data set. And they found that in 1999, the average US child, their diet was made up of 61% ultra processed foods already. By 2018, that number was almost 70% of our children's diet is made oh. of ultra processed food. And so- it's not an accident that we're seeing these multiple epidemics of physical and what we dub to be mental health challenges. The very ingredients that we're making ourselves out of have changed dramatically. 
And so that's kind of the backstory of how I got into this field and what was really the catalyst for this new project and really looking at how does our environment really control our choices? Because truly our culture is a root cause or a root determinant of the choices that we are even aware that we have access to, right? So our culture can block us from the awareness of certain things and it can inundate us with certain things. And that's really what we're targeting. Wow. You know, I've heard your story a few times and every time I hear it, it's, you know, you always give another dimension and it's just phenomenal to go from, you know, did they, they, they hear the MRI scan that you had this spine of a, what, 80, 85 year old. And then it was just, you know, well, not a few months later, not just like around, but there was time in between, but it wasn't that long and how you had to shift your mindset and your diet because your mind is going to influence the nutrition, your body's ability to absorb the nutrition. You said something very interesting that I wanted, you said so many things, but a point I want to just emphasize is that we have these thoughts, you said, we have these thoughts going on in our head and then you look for the evidence to support that thinking. That is a very powerful statement. And it's something that people need to actually just think about and, and, and ask yourself, are you have is there some sort of dominant thought that you are thinking about yourself, about your life, about your body, about whatever, about a combination, maybe more than one thought? And are you just looking for evidence to support that? Because there that you did that and then you realized it was creating the wrong kind of support structure and you shifted and changed it which is amazing and then something else I don't know if you're aware of this but I was told I was being interviewed the other day by Jamila Jamil who's that actress who's amazing and she said that we were talking about processed food and she made a comment and I wonder if you're aware of this we don't like Putin obviously I mean what he's doing in the United States I mean in in Russia is and Ukraine is is terrible but do you know that he's obsessed with organic food I didn't realize this and that the that, that the whole philosophy of eating healthy food and organic GMO, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know all the exact details, but that is his focus. And he made a comment, apparently, that um, he doesn't have to beat America with guns. He just has to beat America with food because they're killing themselves already. And I mean, I'm paraphrasing. I don't know the exact quote. I could be misquoting. But it was very interesting if that is, you know, if that is absolutely correct or something along those lines. It was a shock and an eye opener because that, you know, that is, and you you quoted those statistics, you know, we really do need to wake up and without getting obsessive and going down the track in the wrong way. This is why I like how you present this whole idea of eating healthy. And this book that you brought out is, a, is, a, is an absolute godsend for people to learn how to understand this whole thing. And one of the things that really caught me about your book is, I mean, just scrolling through, there's your gorgeous family all throughout the, the, the pictures of you and your cute son with his little cute hair style and, you know, your beautiful wife and your elder son. And you, there's all this family stuff. It's beautiful. Relationships are so critical and so key. We are desi designed for deep, structured for deep, meaningful relationships, which enables us to be able to absorb nutrition more effectively and how uh, from the ancient of ancient days we have celebrated life and meaningfulness around food and so take it from there because I know that that's a big part of your approach absolutely you know and just to kind of piggyback on what you shared about the state of health in the United States so the CDC's numbers last year uh, they determined that currently 60 percent of American adults have at least one chronic disease now and 40% have two or more. Wow. So the majority of our citizens have a chronic disease now. And this, and if you look at the other side of this, this means that if you don't have a chronic disease, you are abnormal. You're not in the average anymore. You're not in the, the quote norm. These are the preventable, this, preventable lifestyle diseases. Preventable. Right. Lifestyle. By the way, this, right. this has been known. This isn't a huge revelation, but unfortunately, sometimes we need data to affirm what we already know. But the Journal of the American Medical Association did a big meta-analysis published in 2018. They determined, they looked at all the lifestyle factors, smoking and, you know, drinking and exercise. They found that poor diet is the number one cause of our epidemics of chronic disease. It's the number one cause. This is not, it shouldn't be uh, a news for anybody, but sometimes that data helps to affirm what we already know. And, and so with that being said. And it's with our mind that we make the decision to eat that bad food. So we have to get our mind right in order to make the right choices to change these lifestyle diseases. Anyway, I just wanted to insert that there. That but part, that's exactly, that's exactly the, the truth. And, you know, this is why we use different ways of tapping in to our mind and, and opening up that, that channel, that awareness by stacking conditions and 
really helping to, again, because that's the driver of our behaviors. Unfortunately, we try so often to target behaviors and force people to make behavior change. All change starts with the mind. And so, you know, this, this is something that I happened upon. And eventually, of course, having you in my life has been like this superpower unlocked, but I've been integrating this into my work for many years. And so knowing that that's the, the current state of health in the United States, and of course, this is not just a United States issue. I went to work at looking like, what are the highest leverage points for altering, making positive shifts with our mind that lead to better outcomes? And one of the highest leverage points was our environment and our relationships. Because again, it's not that we can't think positive thoughts or uh, choose to be compassionate and patient and you know express drive and all these different things when we're not feeling well. We absolutely can, it's just harder. It's a lot harder because all of that requires energy. All of that requires um, the ability to manage all these things. And you talk again a lot about mind management. And so with that being said, I went to work and looking like, okay, is, is this in fact from the data, the biggest leverage point? And I have a colleague at Harvard University who is the director of the longest running human study on longevity. Mm -hmm. And he's, the torch has been passed down from person to person. Yes. And when he first got involved, he couldn't believe what the data was showing on like, what is the most, what is the most powerful, as, I'm sorry? Interviewed him. Oh, yes. Wald Dinger. All right, yes. my guy, Wald Dinger. All right. So he, he he couldn't believe it. So other scientists had to replicate the data to affirm this, but they determined that the number one influential factor in human longevity was the quality of your relationships. Mm -hmm. It has this, it has this very powerful epigenetic influence on what's happening with our with our biology and really what's happening with our mind. That's what's really going on. And so one of the studies that I cited in the new cookbook, this was a huge meta-analysis. It was 148 studies, which is unheard of, over 300,000 people. And they found that the quality of your relationships, people who have warm or healthy social connections had a 50% reduction in all-cause mortality on average. This is a 50% reduction in death from everything, essentially, based on the quality of our relationships. And so just digging into this more, I was like, okay, so how does this tie into food? Is there something protective about eating together? Because a lot of our relationships involve food. It's just how we evolved. A lot of, you know, celebration, conversations, first dates, uh, date nights, uh, post-game uh, celebrations or post-game you know, uh, just getting together and talking about the challenges, whatever the case might be, we can go on and on and on. So much of our culture revolves around food, but we never stop to ask, what about not just the occasional celebration, but our day-to-day -day lives? Mm -hmm. Humans have eaten together for thousands and upon thousands of years. As a matter of fact, it was required that everybody in the tribe is involved whether it's the procurement of food, hunting, gathering, the food preparation, and of course, the, the eating together and celebration. Just coming back from Maui, what we see glamorized as this concept, this luau, this is how things were. Like we would tell stories and celebrate music, dance, community, connection. It was a normal part of life. And researchers, and this is, some other folks at Harvard collected data on uh, human behavior, eating together as a family and, and health outcomes, food mm -hmm. choice outcomes for families, decades of data. And I, I found this and I was like, how does the world not know this? Right. And what they found was that families that eat together on a regular basis have significantly higher intake of essential nutrients that help to prevent chronic diseases and significantly reduced intake of ultra processed foods chips soda and things of the like and so that now i'm starting to tie in this relationship longevity component our historical uh, interaction as a tribe together with food and now what do we have today with our microcultures in our household what happened with this behavior and can eating together be some kind of this invisible shield in, in essence, in helping to reduce the risk of disease and dysfunction with our families in particular for our children. And so I'm gonna share two more quick studies with you. 
One of them is published in the journal Pediatrics. The other was published in JAMA, Journal of the American Medical, Medical Association. And what these researchers found was that simply by eating together with your children three times a week was that kind of minimum effective dose dramatically reduced the incidence of, of obesity in the children and dramatically reduced the incidence of disordered eating. Isn't that incredible? Just by eating together. That's true. When I saw that in your book, and I mean, I've read a lot of these studies, but when I saw that just three, three times a week, it's not even, you know, how many meals do we eat in a week? I mean, it's a lot more than three, and it's just three that will make that significant difference. And on the other side of that, what happens when we don't eat together? And we've got data on this too. And you know, you already know how I do it. I was searching like, is there something? Because I we know just kind of intuitively yeah. what would happen, but there is data to affirm this because scientists are asking these questions. Another study is published in Nutrition Journal found that people who eat in isolation frequently tend to have a significantly poorer quality of diet and they have a significantly lower intake of vital nutrients. When we're eating in isolation, for the average person, our health outcomes tend to be worse. And so, again, my question was, is this practice that we've been doing forever, not doing it, causing more harm in our culture? And so here's what those researchers at Harvard that I mentioned earlier, here's what they found. The average American family today, only 30% of families eat together on a regular basis. All right. Great. This is... It's, it's, it's devolving rapidly. This is now on the endangered species list as a protective metric for our families. And I don't think people know about this. So I was just like, I have to put this into book form, get this out in a big way and really lead the charge towards really helping to stack conditions in the favor of our families and really reigniting because here, and also we're not here to villainize any of this stuff. It's great to grab some food to have a movie night or, you know, watch the game, whatever. That's all good. But when that becomes the yeah. predominant thing that we do, when oftentimes, and by the way, even there have been many lunches as I'm in my office right now that I might grab my lunch and I'll watch clips of uh, Conan O'Brien on YouTube or, you know, some stand up or something, you know, I just put on something, you know, yeah. and it, there's nothing wrong with that. But when I'm not having that time eating with my family, eating with my friends and being able to, because there's a difference between relaxation and restoration. Absolutely. All right. Relaxation is again, we're kicking back, watching something, but your brain is still very active. Mm -hmm. And also again, all of that stuff is just getting absorbed into your, into your person. Exactly. And so, consciously. Exactly. And so, but being able to, shut that down and to be able to share the space with people that you care about. This is one of the most powerful de-stressors that we see in science, because one thing that we know today, which is this has become a little bit more popular, thankfully, but just being around people that we care about, we start producing di different chemistry, in particular oxytocin. And oxytocin has this kind of mediating effect with cortisol. And so what's said is this fight or flight nervous system, sympathetic nervous system, as that's running, for most people, it's always just running at a low-grade fever. When we get spikes that go up, we never really shut it off unless we're knocked out, you know, unless we're asleep or something like that. But the other form of that nervous system is basically it's a binary system. We have sympathetic fight or flight, or you switch over to parasympathetic rest and digest, rest and digest. This is another powerful aspect of eating together with people that we care about is the, the benefits that it has with our assimilation of nutrients, our ability to downregulate and reduce stress. And stress is one of the leading components of our disease epidemics. Okay. And I'll share one more study. This was in JAMA as well. Big net meta-analysis. They found that 60 to 80% of all physician visits are for stress-related yeah, issues. Yeah. I've All seen, right. I've, so I've seen stress high, is killing us. Yes. Chronic unmanaged stress will, it's been totally established for years now. Chronic unmanaged stress will increase your vulnerability to lifestyle diseases and mental health challenges. It's a fact. You know, and there's actually even studies talking about it as being as high as 75% of, of doctors, physicians visits are for chronic unmanaged stress. So it's, um, you know, and, and you, what you're saying here is that we can, we just by eating together, 
you're already reducing. Look at those huge num- those numbers that you that you that you mentioned. I mean, this is this is scientific evidence. And three times a week, that's not something that's difficult to do, but it's a major change in how you function. And listen to this. So there was a study that was done on uh, office workers. All right. So this is a huge percentage of our population. This was published in Family and Consumer Sciences, and they found that if employees were able to make it home and have dinner with their families, it dramatically reduced the tension and stress from work, kept their work morale high, and enabled them to have more fulfillment. And as their work started to cut into those family dinners and being able to spend time in that context with their family, work morale went down, stress levels shot up, because again, there's something really rejuvenative about eating face-to-face, sharing space with people that we care about. And then by the way, this is not just family, this is friends as well, is including in in this, because again, we evolved with tribe. And I'm telling you, all the data points to, this is a powerful epigenetic controller, is the quality of our relationships, especially in the context of mealtimes. Oh, I so 100% agree with you. I even remember telling my patients when I was still practicing that even if you have a huge crisis going on in your home, just to decompress, just make that meal together, sit and have that meal and at that meal, don't talk about the issue that's going on in, in the family or whatever it is at that moment. Just enjoy the meal together and that immediately would help heal the mind brain body network to a point where you can then go do more of the work to solve the problem. So I'm so glad you brought that all up. I mean, people think this is going to be a nutritional interview about just what to eat. You can see it so much more. And that's why I love your approach. Of course, of course. So the the most important thing to to realize, and I highlighted this a little bit earlier, is that we have the opportunity to choose what we're making our tissues out of, what we're making our, basically, as we're seeing each other right now, as beautiful as you are, what I'm seeing is the proteins that you've eaten, the minerals that you've eaten. And this is what we see when we look in the mirror. When we see each other, we're seeing largely protein is a huge part of this and the minerals that people have consumed as well. It's a big part of like the visual outside aspect and inside as well of a a human being and also everything, everything in nature. Proteins are huge. And when I was in school, I was taught DNA to RNA to protein, right? DNA to RNA to protein. So we have this instruction manual in making all this stuff. And with that being said, what compounds, what ingredients, what raw materials are we giving our bodies to make those proteins? Because your body is going to do the job that that you enable it to do. It can kind of like rob Peter to pay Paul kind of thing and do a patchwork job putting you together. That's what I experienced. I was just a kid and my body was breaking down rapidly, literally just deteriorating back into base nutrients, essentially. My, my spine, my hips were just, it was crazy. And as soon as I started providing those raw materials, now that process, now my body can make better quality materials. And so with this being said, the same thing holds true for our metabolic health, because it's not just the tissues themselves that are made of food, the ability for ourselves to talk to each other, whether it's our hormones, our hormones, by the way, a lot of people talk about hormones now, hormones are proteins, right? When it boils down to it, these are proteins. If you're not providing these building blocks, it's very difficult to make these things. And so, but your proteins are essentially, these are like metabolic DMs and they're like sending messages back and forth uh, to different parts of your body. And there can be an an issue where if a certain hormone is getting, we'll just say it's spamming Mm -hmm. your, your fat cells. And I'm talking about insulin, for example. And it's just like so much junk mail is coming in to the degree, like your fat cells, like I've had enough And this is now put into the spam folder and it can't really get that signal coming in. This is insulin resistance. And in our, unfortunately, in our field, in the field of medicine, when this situation occurs, when a person is not born with diabetes, they develop it through, you know, different lifestyle factors, in particular, an abnormal influx of sugar, which we never evolved, not even close to that much sugar exposure by ourselves. And so that spam folder getting sent there, that insulin resistance is not that far away once you're exposing your body to abnormal amounts of sugar because it has to protect you. And so now that that, this process is happening, all that sugar that's running around in your bloodstream is very dangerous. It can start to kind of break stuff down prematurely. 
This is what we see, for example, with type 2 diabetes and the loss of limbs, uh, loss of vision. You know, those capillaries are especially uh, vulnerable to abnormal amounts of sugar. And not to mention, diabetes is usually paired with other comorbidities, heart disease, Alzheimer's, uh, arthritis, the, the list goes on and on and other conditions that come along with it because it's a, really an advanced aging condition. And so in our field, unfortunately, what's treated is now that we have insulin resistance, we'll just say, all right, just put in more insulin, right? Exactly. That's where we eventually get to after the metformin, after other um, other inputs, eventually people are put on insulin. When, the, when it's already getting spammed, we just put more in. And unfortunately, that shortly thereafter is where we see things like kidney failure, is where we see things like heart attacks. And that's not what's talked about. Instead of us realizing that this manifestation of type 2 diabetes is, it's an, it's an alteration, it's an intelligent switch by the body to basically start functioning under unideal circumstances. It's an adaptation. Mm -hmm. Again, we're not born with it. It is activated due to certain inputs and, and, and exposures. And I'm going to share this with, again, with some, with some sound long-term study here, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And the title of the study is effectively 200 Years of Diabetes. And the rates of type 2 diabetes were literally just pretty much the same for over a century. Wow. And then about 50 years ago, something happened. And the rates of type 2 diabetes quadrupled in our population. It just exploded. And currently in the U.S., about 130 million Americans have type 2 diabetes or prediabetes right now as of this recording. It is unbelievable. Unbelievable. Same and so to circle it all back to like, what do we do? How do we utilize food to improve our metabolic health? Number one, the, the biggest thing, because also in our culture, we tend to, we tend, we, we have this programming to look for a pill or a supplement or something to, 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 to add in. But if you're not removing the cause of the problem, you're just like sprinkling sugar on, it's you know what, on poop emoji. Exactly. Yeah. And it's a, it's a band-aid approach. It's also, you know, it's also that mechanistic approach that you just, this machine and if your part's missing, just put it in, but it's so much more complex. You know, and that the whole mind aspect driving it. So you know, go ahead, keep going. It's excellent. And what we've seen recently is that, you know, just about a little over a century ago, the average Westerner was eating somewhere around, we'll just say, we'll say under 10 pounds of sugar annually, but it was yeah. really somewhere closer to like four to six pounds. All right. And I'm talking about still recently in human history. But prior to that, it was much less because we just didn't have concentrated forms of sugar prior to, you know, the invention of, you know, synthetic uh, manipulation of different sugars, but also like concentrated forms, sugar cane, beet sugar, all that stuff. And my wife being from Kenya, they ate sugar cane, like they would chew on that, it's supposed to be like good for your teeth and all this stuff. But we found processing to like deliver huge amounts of sweetness that had never existed before. Fast forward to today. The average American is now eating somewhere in the ballpark of about 70 pounds of added sugars annually, 70 pounds that's added on it's, top of the already existing sugar in the products. Phew. <laughs> When you, when you hear those numbers, it blows your mind. And it's like, it's crazy. It's crazy. You talk about the sugar cane growing up in South Africa. My husband, as you, as you now know, he was also born in Kenya and grew up in Kenya, but we would, we would, we would have sugar cane and you think of how much effort would go into chewing that sugar cane to get a little bit of sugar out of it it makes that in that context that's the right amount that our body needs and that's been so distorted anyway yeah and now we're eating for example i this is a true story when i was like seven eight years old uh every day i would go to 7-eleven for my mother and get her a big gulp at, at 7-eleven full of pepsi and then super big gulp came out and then double gulp came out all right, so this is the containers were so big that they didn't even have them already put together. You had to like pull out the flat cardboard and then basically fold it together and then put all your soda in there. It's insane. And every time they offered a bigger option, that's what she would get. And I was just there to get the change and so I could play a video game, right? Like, but I'm now being again, I'm getting my little snacks and it's just like this is getting normalized, but here's here's the here's the numbers. 
by her consuming even you know 20 ounces of a soda, this is somewhere in the ballpark of 16 teaspoons of sugar in that beverage and is delivered in liquid form. And so this, as far as any nutritional advice and things that are based on the most science, the number one thing that's causing so much metabolic damage is liquid sugar. Sugar that's coming in the form of these sodas, of juice, so-called juice, right? With good intention, that same 20 ounce of quote, you know, fresh juice, but it's not, not really fresh, but you know, and I, that was my thing because I thought I was being healthy, being the athlete, I would get all this orange juice, but that same 20 ounces of orange juice is about 14 grams of sugar. I'm sorry, 14 teaspoons, 14 teaspoons of sugar, not far behind the soda. That is a tremendous amount of sugar that would not exist in nature. In nature, I'm eating the orange. I'm not eating concentrated orange juice. That's just delivering all this sugar rapidly to my cells. And not to mention, my favorite thing growing up was, uh, it wasn't juice, it was drink. I don't know, do you know about this, Dr. Leaf? Drink, no. So instead of orange juice, I would drink orange drink. All right, so there was 0% juice, but it looked orange, it tasted delicious, but it was just all sugar, food dyes, artificial flavors, preservatives, all this stuff. It is just so toxic for the body, but that was what I grew up with. And so my advocation number one for everybody is to really move away from the liquid sugar yeah. the, to the best of our abilities. And it's not to villainize again, if you want to have uh, a soda every now and then on an occasion, but if you're regularly drinking this stuff, I've seen it in my clinical practice. As soon as people stop drinking sugar, they, the weight starts coming off and their blood sugar starts to normalize. Like that is like the biggest lifestyle change that they can make. And now adding on top of that, listen to this. This study was published in Frontiers in Endocrinology and it found dramatic changes in blood sugar, shifting from high blood sugar spikes to impending crashes, increase anxiety, mm. trigger hyperactivity in the emotional centers of the brain. And now here's a little bit of a, matchup for this. Studies cited in both the journals Nutrients and Molecular Nutrition and Food Research found that a food that we, many of us know about today, avocados, increase our insulin sensitivity and improve blood sugar levels. So food being used as this, this really remarkable medicinal input to help to normalize blood sugar, right? And this, the thing is, there's so much science. On it. I'm just throwing one food out there. Science. That's true. There is so much science. Now, it's almost like people don't have an excuse to not understand because there is more. A few years ago, it wasn't. But now there is so much really great research that's happening. It's still, it's still a field that needs a lot of research. But as you say, being able to medicate with an avocado is so much. It's fantastic as part of people's healing to be able to use what we can eat. So it's, it's becoming more and more and more, even from the last time I interviewed you, there's more and more awareness of this all over the place now, which is you know, the nutritional psychiatry and that kind of thing, which is really fantastic. It's really fantastic. Sean, what, what about, I mean, there's so much more around the met metabolism, but you did a brilliant summary there. You have in chapter three, you talk about eating with a purpose. And I really enjoyed that. Um, can, can you chat a little bit about eating with a purpose? Absolutely. So this is such a great segue, by the way. You know, a lot of the times when we're making food choices, again, it's based on our cultural influence. And so now we have the ability to really take control of the, the steering wheel, you know, really grab the reins and start to eat for the purpose that we want, right? So what I did was I identified some of the most science-backed real foods and provided the data on, so for example, if somebody's wanting to improve their sleep quality, maybe they've struggled with their sleep quality, there are key what I call good sleep nutrients that are required to build sleep-related hormones and neurotransmitters. Again, you have to give your body these essential nutrients, or you can have the most fancy pants mattress and all the external stuff. But if you're not giving your body the raw materials to make these things to help to rejuvenate your body, you're going to struggle. Mm -hmm. And so within these foods, I identified uh, some of the foods. Well, actually, since we already just mentioned avocados, I just mentioned this one again. They're packed with these sleep supportive nutrients. Potassium is one, uh, B6, magnesium. And scientists at the University of Illinois' Urbana-Champaign found that 
This food can also increase the diversity of our gut bacteria, which a lot of our sleep-related hormones and neurotransmitters are made in our gut. And I'm not trying to get onto an avocado uh, soapbox here. And again, because, yeah. because I didn't even eat avocados myself until I was well into my adulthood because I just thought it was so weird. And so what I did was if somebody is interested in improving their metabolic health, or if they're interested in, in improving their sleep quality, if they're improve, in, interested in improving their cognitive function, each of these foods that I've identified, we have correlating emojis when you learn all the science about them. So you'll have a brain emoji or you'll have a, 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 a sleep emoji or the little muscle emoji if it's good for your metabolic health. And then this is the coolest part about it is, so now we're eating with a, with a purpose. Now we go to the recipe section. There's over a hundred delici delicious recipes. And people say that, but no, like I'm a foodie. I love, I love food. I love I? food. It's one of the joys of life. Humans, we have this flavor palette that has evolved with us to drive us to eat things that right. taste good. That's why they taste good. Exactly, the biochemical signature yes. that they leave as well. You explained that so beautifully, the biochemical signature that the, you, that the food leaves so that your brain knows that that's the level of nutrition. I mean, it's just so cool, that whole that whole little feedback loop. Do you want to quickly explain that? Just a quick side thing. I always love that. Of course. So that's called post-ingestive feedback. And so as we evolved, our, our cells would basically take notes on what you just got from that food that you just ate. And of course, all this is stored in the mind, by the way, but it's just like basically taking notes, like this flavor that I just experienced, right? This, this cherry flavor comes along with, oh, this uh, uh, melatonin, by the way, cherries are one of the most concentrated sources of melatonin in, in the food kingdom. Uh, it's coming along with vitamin C, it's coming along. And so our, our cells are just taking these notes saying that, hey, this flavor comes along with those nutrients. And it creates these certain flavor uh, notes that drive us towards, once we reach a place of deficiency, we would start to crave certain things. Here's the problem. Food scientists have manipulated these channels, absolutely. Where now our ability to adequately assess a flavor coming along with certain nutrients that the water has been not just muddied up, it is dirty and nasty because there was an invention, well, there are many since, but once the gas chromatograph was invented, now we could isolate the, chem the chemistry that creates that flavor. And so now food manufacturers can take the flavor of cherry and add it to soda or add it to candy or add it to fill in the blank. No cherries necessary. And it doesn't have to taste exactly like a cherry, by the way, but it's just enough to like Activate muddy that. up those waters, right? And so what we're doing is this process is also healing for our biology and also for our palate to start to reassociate because food isn't just food, it's information exactly. really at its core. And so we're really providing information to turn on the intelligence with our biology. And so now again, we're taking something like an avocado and we're creating uh, you know, this heart healthy shake, for example, or we're taking something like sweet potatoes, which are packed with these anthocyanins that improve your cognitive function, and we're making sweet potato pancakes, mm -hmm. right? Or we're taking a food that everybody knows about with uh, fatty fish like salmon. But now I'm really, I'm giving you the best, most recent cutting edge science about it. But now we're going to upgrade that. We're going to do this sriracha honey salmon that you're going to absolutely love. And just like, again, we enjoy the process of eating real foods and also having these flavors. My son, just last night, my youngest son, we just had something they hadn't had before, you know? And of course he's coming in like, I don't know, you know, like, I don't know what this, but it's just like me understanding him yeah. and, you know, being able to weave in these real food elements in a way that is so delicious and, and palatable and attractive. But also this is not to say that we don't introduce some things that might take a retraining, right? Especially like bitter foods, fermented things. One of the things that I found while working at the university for many years, I was I started asking people about, so I got to work with people from all over the world. Yeah. Every single culture had cultured foods, right? And it's just like, that is that where the name comes from with cultured foods? And so Ethiopian clients had like this fermented bread. And obviously, you know, people know about kimchi is having a moment now as well. And one of the studies I shared in the book as well on kimchi 
uh, the researchers put basically the ingredients that are used to make kimchi, right? So the daikon, radish, and the cabbage, all this stuff, but in its unfermented form, had test subjects consume that versus just when it's fermented. Yeah. Same food, but yeah. when it's fermented, it led to dramatically increased uh, body fat loss. So it increased their loss of body fat when it was fermented. And it's just like mind blowing stuff. But how do you use kimchi? Something that can be, again, it's, it's got a bite to it in a, in a way that's delicious and being able to integrate more of these, these foods into our families, into our, into our diet, we've got to get exposure, but I'm telling you the pathway there is through deliciousness education. Absolutely. You said it's a beautiful book. My family's all in this book, but what we're doing is being a model, you know, and creating giving people the power to create a microculture in their house that makes health easy to access and fun and improve our connection as a family. I love that. And you you actually have a, a fun a fun title here, Defend Your Family Against Cultural Contagions. Just just talk for a little moment about that. Absolutely. Okay. So building this culture intentionally within our households, this is what this is really all about. Mm-hmm. And For many years, and I know you've done this as well, we recommend for patients and people, just people we're trying to educate on behavior changes and missing out on the fact that it's very difficult to make a behavior change in an environment that is inundating you with behaviors that are counter to this. You become the weird one. It is very, very hard to maintain a behavior change because the culture is controlling what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Now, our culture is the values, beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors that are shared by a community and passed on from one generation to the next. That's what a culture is. You inherently are going to pass this along yeah. to future generations. We have no choice but to be influenced by our culture. Mm-hmm. And so our culture creates an atmosphere to where we are literally unaware of certain things and we are hyper aware of other things. For example, Hunter gatherer tribes, right? They're still even in Kenya. You know, there there are still tribes that are much closer connected to more of the kind of indigenous way of life, mm-hmm. and their culture has created this block in awareness that McDonald's is a place where you get something to eat. Like if the Maasai the Maasai are doing their thing, their animal husbandry, they're out on the land, and McDonald's is just not an option for them. This is something they're not aware of. Mm -hmm. At the same time, their culture has also programmed something deep in their mind. And this is this belief that if I don't move, I will die. If I'm not active, I will die. I have to have the ability to procure my food. You know, other tribes as well. I have to, I have to hunt, I have to gather my food or I die. In our culture, movement is optional today. All right. And it's just that it, it is what it is. And again, not to villainize it, we've done things to make our lives easier, but we've pulled more and more of our movement out of our lives. Mm-hmm. And so, and we know the health ramifications are not good, but the cultural contagions that I identified were specifically through the lens of certain foods that are causing the biggest disruption to our biology. And, you know, uh, we already talked about one being all this concentrated sugar that we're consuming, but there are two other big ones. And one of them, because I know we got limited time here, but I'll share one more. Mm, And I was shocked by this one. Yeah, please go ahead. I was shocked by this one because I paid for my university education. It was a lot of money. And in my nutritional science class, we were taught that we need to get in seven to 11 servings of grains in order to, you know, really fulfill an optimal healthy diet, seven to 11 servings of whole grains. Mm -hmm. All right. And of course, we take on this idea, this this diet dogma, because we want to do the best that we can for ourselves and also the people that we'll potentially be working with. And so it wasn't done in a nefarious way, but the results have not been very good. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason, it isn't just the fact that all of those grains get converted to glucose in our bodies, Mm -hmm. which we already talked about. It's not just sugar. It is Anything that gets converted into glucose in rampant amounts, which grains do that. What is the fact that in our, and I'm from St. Louis, Monsanto is one of the biggest companies there. They will come to the job fairs. I wanted to work there. All right. 
But Monsanto, right now, many people have awareness of glyphosate. And um, the WHO has classified glyphosate, this um, fertilizer, yeah. as a class 2A carcinogen. What does that mean? It's a probable cancer causing agent. And it's in everything when we're talking about grains. The Environmental Working Group, and oh, by the way, all of this is in the book. Yeah. The Environmental Working Group did this huge analysis and they found that 80 to 90% of conventional grain products out there, which is the majority of stuff on our store shelves, by the way, is contaminated with glyphosate. Theory. It is insane. So we're literally eating something so toxic. We're trying to do better because what I did when I was trying to improve my health, the first step was, I was like, I need to stop eating this kid cereal. All right, stop eating Honey Nut Cheerios. I'm gonna eat an adult cereal. And I started eating Quaker oatmeal squares to get my fiber in because that's again what my professors said to do. And come to find out in the study, Quaker oatmeal squares was one of the highest offenders with glyphosate contamination. That's All right. So again, we've got to protect our family from these cultural contagions. It's just like, this is what's happening right now. And it is what it is. How we change it is starting with ourselves yeah. and starting with our families, because the secret that shouldn't be a secret is Yes, we can go out there and do big picture education and change, but the most powerful form of change is when people are exposed to what's possible. And when people see my family, when people see people that have figured this stuff out, that have this connection, that have this level of health in a society that is now, again, it's abnormal to be healthy. There is this attractive force and I've seen it time and time again. The most powerful, Gandhi said this, be the change you wish to see. Like we say this, people love to put it out there, but truly by you getting healthier and your family healthier, that's how you affect your community. That's how you affect your family in a bigger way, your, your, your extended family. Absolutely. Three quick things. I don't know how quickly we can do them. I, I just want to touch on you. You talk about artificial sweeteners. I wanted you brief to touch on them because there's a lot of stuff out there on, on that and you have a great way of handling it. Um, the protein in our grass-fed beef is so different to the commercial beef. I know that's a huge question. Um, that, you know, for example, in Europe, the A1 protein is so much healthier for our body, and it's been genetically bred out of a lot of the the um, cattle here in this country. So that the protein is not quite the same. I don't know if you want to, if you can touch on that or not. You don't have to. And then thirdly, um, let's just handle those. Talk talk a little bit about those two quickly, and then All I right, what's what's the first one? Artificial sweeteners. So artificial sweeteners. Yeah. Absolutely. I did question. a little subsection on this because this is one of those subjects, unfortunately, is still pretty controversial. Yeah. And it's because a lot of people who are in the health and fitness world have found a lot of benefit by utilizing artificial sweeteners and not the you know kind of conventional concentrated forms of sugar. And I'm to touch on it, it is a controversial to so give people a little bit of guidance there. Absolutely. So here's the thing. A lot of times because something works for us, we think it works globally. Like this works for everybody. I did, I know this because I did that. When I was into a certain nutritional program, when I was doing my clinical work, that's what you were going to be into. All right. Whatever diet I think is the best, that's what. But thankfully, over time, I realized that everybody is different. We all are incredibly unique and we need to find out what's best for you right now where you are. And even that is going to change. And so with that said, utilizing this for some people has been successful. So we tend to get tunnel vision and mm -hmm. just look for data to affirm that there's no problem with artificial sweeteners. So I'm just, just going to share a little bit of this data really quickly. This recent study was conducted by researchers at Boston University School of Medicine. And it's published in the peer-reviewed journal Stroke. All right. We're already, do you see where this is going? And the researchers uncovered a surprising link between drinking diet, so, diet soda and two debilitating issue, issues. The researchers found that people were almost three times more likely to have a stroke and develop dementia if they were drinking one diet soda a day versus people who did not drink diet sodas or drink them very frequently. So that's number one. Number two, in the last part that I'll share here, and what we have some of the most dense science on that's only recently come out, this was published in Advances in Nutrition, and it found that sucralose, one of the most popular artificial sweeteners, distinctly alters our microbiome, 
all right, distinctly alters our microbiome in a way that promotes inflammation, mm. all right? So we know that these artificial sweeteners, they're not just, they're, they're not nothing because that can be the mindset. It's a zero calorie, whatever. No, these are, these are construction of chemicals that are informing change in your biology, in particular, creating disruption with our microbiome. And so I detail that more in the book and kind of breaking down some of the finer points. But the bottom line is something like um, uh, artificial sweeteners, they don't come without a cost. Exactly. And, and I like how you handle it. Things like stevia. Do you have a comment on things like stevia, which is a plant leaf? Absolutely. So stevia is, again, stevia has been around for thousands of years, by the way. It's a sweet, it, and I've, again, I've been in this field for 21 years. Mm-hmm. Stevia, I've had the real stevia leaves, dried leaves. They they have this little nice sweetness, but they also have this kind of like medicine-y like aftertaste. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's fine to integrate some of that stuff. This is a natural concentrated kind of low calorie or zero calorie sweetener. But when we get into, and I might even like having a couple of drops of stevia here or there, that's fine. But when we get bags of this stuff, that looks like sugar, that looks like illicit drugs. Yeah. Maybe our antennas can come up, a red flag can come up saying, hey, wait, this, I know that they're saying that this is better to do for my baking and all this stuff, but man, this is, this is in every sense of, of the word, an ultra processed food. Yeah. So we pick. need to be careful about that. It's not that we can't use it, okay. but in this book, I'm very, I'm very, very bullish and active on promoting what sweetener we've been utilizing for the longest as a species in particular. All right, so this study was published in Evidence-Based Complementary and Alternative Medicine, and it found that antioxidants in honey have nootropic effects such as memory enhancement. Honey has the ability to potentially improve our memory. And also, in addition to that, and this is what's most remarkable in talking about this as a sweetener, which I think it is a gross underestimation of honey when we just classify it as a sweetener because of this. It's got so many other things, yeah. A recent study published in the peer-reviewed journal Nutrients found that raw honey, raw honey, not the heat-treated, the little honey bear, not that stuff. Raw honey can improve our fasting blood sugar levels. They also found it improves lipid metabolism and reduces the risk of heart disease. No other sweetener can improve your fasting blood sugar levels. There's something special about this food. It's not just a mere food. This is why I utilize honey for many of the recipes. I made the honey sriracha salmon. I'm weaving together these delicious foods in a way that we're getting all this powerful nutrition and information into our bodies. So beautiful. It's I, I love that. And, and I, I even give my dogs a teaspoon of raw honey every day because it's good for dogs too. So there you go, my two little puppies. Sean, we could talk for hours and there's so many other questions I have. We'll do another, definitely do we'll follow up on this. But I'm going to just tell people very, can you tell people very quickly in just two minutes, um, the layout of the book, that this is uh, just a little bit so that they understand how to work through the book and use the book in their life. And then where can they get the book and where can they find out more about you? Awesome. And so, so I believe this is coming out when the book is, is out. Yes, yes, it is. And so you could pick up a copy of the Eat Smarter Family Cookbook anywhere that books are sold from your favorite retailer, of course, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all that good stuff. And also you can pop over to eatsmartercookbook.com. We've got some cool bonuses there as well. But most importantly, this is this is a movement. This is really a movement towards family wellness. And that's really the, the big focus of this mission. And by investing in your family in this way, this is this is a resource that I promise you, it's going to impact your life and be a part of your life for many years to come. I designed it to be that way. It's so rich and empowering information, but also again, just being able to make delicious food and to have that, there's something that educates your body beyond just brain kind of food, you know, being able to pull in information. When you're eating something like, again, even in the context of the microbiome, when you eat a blueberry, you're eating that blueberry's microbiome. When you eat an avocado, you're eating that avocado's microbiome. We're changing and improving, upgrading the status of our bodies from the inside out. And so, so powerful. And again, I would love for everybody to be a part of this movement to really double down on investing in your own health and the health of your family. 
because I think that we can create a tipping point here to normalize health and fitness again in our culture. It's a book that everyone needs to get and have on their kitchen shelf or accessible so you can pull it down, not just for recipes, but for these little, very easy to read chunks of information that will just guide you so much. It's amazing. I love it. Thank you. Thank you so much for writing this book. And I, I mean, I just really, you're, everything you do is just amazing. And the food, I cannot wait to start using this book constantly in my life. So thank you, Sean. It's always such a pleasure. And I'm excited to talk to you again soon. Thank you for joining me Thank today. You. Next time we'll be there in Dallas. We'll do this together. In Dallas. And we, you know, we'll do a cooking show together. How about that? We'll do. Oh, that sounds so fun. We should do that. Seriously. That'll be so much fun. We can talk about the mind and the brain and be doing a whole cooking thing. I'm sure everyone would love that. So that, that's either going to be in your kitchen or my kitchen. So there you go. It Come shall on. be done. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sean.